If you said to me to describe this story, I would say, don't believe it, but it's true. I can't even imagine somebody doing something like this. It's also the perfect crime, because sometimes the thing that's blatant right in front of your face is a thing you don't expect. I was going to be a million dollar winner. I was game for something exhilarating. From 1989 to 2001, there were almost no legitimate winners of the high value game pieces in the McDonald's Monopoly game. Uncle Jerry told me, if you want a game piece, this is how it's done. Hi, I'm James Lee Hernandez. And I'm Brian Lazarte. We are the executive producers and directors of the six part documentary series, McMillions on HBO. And this is the official McMillions podcast, episode two. Brian, give us a little rundown of what people saw on episode two of McMillions on HBO. This was the first chance that we had to introduce everyone to the criminal side of the story. We met Marvin Braun, who is the stepbrother to Jerry Jacobson. We got to meet Robin Colombo, who is the wife of Jerry Colombo, and Frank Colombo, who is the brother of Jerry Colombo. We also got to understand the working relationship between the two Jerry's and learn a little bit about St. Jude's. This episode, we have a few things we're really excited to talk about. James, you want to tell everyone what we have? So in this episode, we are going to talk to our special in-studio guest, Robin Colombo. We're going to learn more about the Colombo side of the family, how the mafia got involved in this entire thing. We'll let you guys know what Robin did to get kicked out of Jerry Colombo's parents' house. Strict rules in the Colombo household. That's, that's what we've learned. I don't think people realize just how massive McDonald's is. This game was so big that McDonald's sales went up about 30 to 40% every time they ran a Monopoly game. We heard about people who would work at a cup manufacturer and they were excited about every time McDonald's ran this game because they could work overtime and make more money for Christmas gifts for their kids. One of the things we wanted to really highlight in this episode was the degree of security that was illustrated by Simon Marketing and Dittler Brothers to protect the game piece. Literally everything that this crime and this investigation revolves around is the game piece. It has to do with the game it piece. It has to do with the game piece. I mean, it's they're not robbing a bank. They're, they're not stealing people's cars. They're stealing a game piece that is worth something. We looked at this game piece as a character, almost like an escape movie, right? Like a prison escape movie. Like how in the world does this one prisoner escape this impenetrable fortress like Shawshank Redemption? Like how did this thing happen? How did this get out from the Fort Knox that was created to protect it? And we always found that fascinating and hopefully we were able to get that point across in this episode. Brian, what did you think when Robin first walked out of her bedroom? How, what was that like for you? When we first got there, we didn't see her right away, right? She was in a room. So someone else answered the door. And there was just a giant plume of smoke in the living room. <laughs> and uh, this, this apartment was literally maybe 10 by 12. I mean, it was, it was teeny, teeny tiny. Yeah, we had to move the TV out of her place so we could fit our cameras in there. I mean, she, she kind of had that rock star persona of like, I'm not going to greet you at the door and then get ready. It's like, I'm doing my thing. I need my space. And, you know, when I'm ready, I'll come out. <laughs> she had come out and got on stage. We sat and talked to her for an entire day that first time, and we could have kept going. It, it's just her, not just the story she has, but the way she tells the story is just so fascinating. But then... Jerry, my Jerry, received a phone call that Uncle Dominic died. How did that happen? I, you know, you don't really talk about that. Joining us now is Robin Colombo, the wife of Jerry Colombo. 
So you had a chance to watch episode two. Mm -hmm. What'd you think? Actually, I was um, surprised at a few things. It was very tasteful. I got to hand it to you. Thank you. It's a big deal for us. It's your life and your story, and, and we really wanted to do it justice. Well, you did. Other than wearing red on red. <laughs> <laughs> on a red couch with a red dress. That's <laughs> that's one of our favorite things. We, it's actually legendarily known as the red interview. <laughs> no. <laughs> it was it was a good it was a good choice. It was a good choice. <laughs> I'm serious. When we go, when I see you again, it's all black. <laughs> <laughs> it's so. You, the, your interview, everyone that's ever seen it is like, I just want to hang out with Robin. Like, she just seems what? so fun to be around. Yeah, it's it's uh, something we've heard a lot. Get out of here. Thank you. I didn't expect that. When you first lock eyes with, with Jerry Colombo, are you just looking at this relationship? You're not thinking about his family and how, how did that relationship go? Well, I know I wasn't thinking about the family at all. I was actually just thinking of him just like my um, protector, my hero, you know, dun da da dun <laughs> Until now, wait, wait, wait. Until now we go to Uncle Tommy's restaurant, Italian restaurant, mind you. Uh, I find out later is a front. You, and I, you're not supposed to send people there to eat <laughs> like I was doing. My back is to the window, right? Yeah. So I don't think anything of it. And after he sits down, he says, um, you know, I don't like to sit with my back to a window in restaurants. And I'm thinking, yeah, really? And I'm like, why? <laughs> you know, because you never know. You get shot. I'm like, well, what the hell? Am I your buffer for a bullet? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Damn. You were his bodyguard. Yeah, right? <laughs> Little me. Because <laughs> I was so tiny. I was like, um, I think I was like size five, six. What was it like to be married to Jerry? A roller coaster. It was a roller coaster ride because there were so many ups and downs and not knowing and, oh, what's going to be next and... At times, it was very glamorous. I think a lot of people glamorize the mob, to be honest with you. Uh, unless they've actually lived it, they do glamorize it. And believe it or not, there's more women out there that like that type of man. They like the bad boys. There's some mystery and intrigue there, you know. I was dating a federal agent at the time, and I went quickly left him. And went to Jerry. And before that federal agent, you were also dating somebody else who was uh, quite famous, oh, right? Alan Collins of Skinner. Right. Yeah, yeah, we dated. The last time I seen Alan, well, we had broke up. A few things had happened. So, you know, I just kind of went my own way. And three months later, he was in a bad car accident where the girl died. And he was crippled. Mm. So... Yeah, and I seen him the last time I seen him. He came into the bar and uh, restaurant that I was managing in his wheelchair. And it was so sad to see because, oh, he was a great guitar player. Awesome. But it was funny when we were dating, we'd be, if we were laying around, I don't care if the radio was on and their music came on the radio. I mean, he would literally jump over me to get, to the radio to turn it up to have me listen to some lick i'm like you know okay i don't know what a lick is <laughs> <laughs> do you know what a lick is now i do i do on the guitar yes i do <laughs> so what did all these men in your life have in common the the guitar player from leonard skinner the federal agent and jerry colombo Famous, bad boys, money. Yeah, that works on me too. <laughs> there was so much that you didn't know about Jerry, your husband. I didn't. He had acquired a black Corvette. Oh. 
from a famous R&B singer who we, we can't name because they happen to still be alive. We have a little snippet of what we took out of that episode. He owed the mob money, so we gave up his car. So my husband went and picked it up. Jerry had it a few months, and he obviously didn't take care of it by putting oil or whatever. He blew the motor. As soon as he did that, it was time to do what he needed to do, do an insurance job. And it miraculously blew up in our driveway. Hey, it worked. He got a $13,000 check a couple weeks later. It almost sounded like bragging about it or something. Ooh. And I really wasn't. I didn't want to know, but he let me know. See, that's the thing about him. A lot of times I would say, don't let me know. He would tell me anyway. And I couldn't shut him up. So it was too late. I knew. You left him to his own devices on stuff like that. I did. I did. I didn't even want to know about that. I made him take me to a hotel so I didn't have to even watch it be done. And we came home the next day. He picked me up and brought me home. And the car, all it was was obviously a frame and ashes. The police or whatever, the fire department had to come and they had to tape all around it and do their investigation, and Jer, I call him Jer, he says, come on with me, and listen. I said, who oh, no, because they'll see it all over my face, you know, you're, you can lie, I can't lie, and I looked out the kitchen window, he had those men eating out of his hand, showing them ways that could have been blown up, like, here's a cigarette butt over here, hey, here's the word WAP, because we were in the South, and he's from New York, you would just love to hang around with him because his personality demands attention. When he walks into a room, you feel his presence. His energy is always uplifting, positive. It was amazing the chemistry he and I had. I could never picture him harming anyone because he was such a teddy bear with me. But yet you knew he, he may have. Yeah, I, uh, I think I was in such denial because he was usually at the casinos. And so I really didn't picture him out harming anyone. I pictured him running the casinos. Well, f- well Frank Colombo, his, his younger brother, I know you guys didn't really cross paths too much. You, you sort of did your own thing. He had the same feelings about his brother regarding humor. Okay, so there is a, there's actually a clip that goes along with this. My name is Frank Colombo. I'm Jerry Colombo's younger brother. I always looked up to my brother. He was a, a fantastic guy. Always had the fancy cars. And I was like, wow, this is great. He was my protector. Nobody messed with his family. No one messed with his little brother. When I was young, I was only like 140 pounds, you know, soaking wet, really short, little skinny kid. When we first moved down here in 1986, I was a freshman in high school. Some kids were picking on me. Uh, I was a new kid, you know, came down from New York, you know, and no one knew who I was. Well, my brother shows up at the high school with two or three guys. They pull up, you know, their little Cadillacs in the front. Walks into the cafeteria while everyone's having lunch. You know, you got like, you know, 750 kids all having lunch together. So my brother goes in the middle of the lunchroom and he's like, hey, if anyone messes with my little brother, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to bust your legs open. And then everyone's like, oh my God, who, 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 is, who is this guy? And everyone was all quiet and listening. And then the very next day, everyone, Frank, anyone bothering you, Frankie? Anyone, anyone bothering you? Let me know, let me know, I'll take care of you. 
I mean, that, the biggest guys in high school were all watching me. And after that especially, no one ever did anything. <laughs> oh my God, that sounds like Jerry. Wow. <laughs> Oh, that is too cute. I'm glad you played that for me. Yeah, that that's exactly Jerry. Um, as a matter of fact, he did that to my uh, hairdresser, unfortunately. Oh, really? <laughs> what did oh, what did he do? Well, I mean, they didn't threaten her per se, but he and a couple of goons, because her and I were going to go to lunch together. I told them this, and. Uh, I did not know that he and two other guys went and paid her a visit and told her that she would not, in fact, be going out to lunch with me. So when I went to get my hair done again, she told me that, Robin, I can't do your hair anymore. Your husband and two of his guys came in here and threatened me. And I'm like, oh, my God. I said, he's not going to hurt you. I promise. And she's like, uh, no, that's okay. You need to find another hairdresser. I go home, Jerry's at home, and I, I'm livid. I get in his face. Well, he has to sit down for me to get in his face. <laughs> 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 so I have him sit down. Then I get in his face. <laughs> and I'm freaking out. I'm going off and blah, 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 you know. And how dare you, you know. And all I, I said, no, this isn't one of them things that we laugh at. You threatened my hairdresser. This is serious. He did not take that serious. He really did not see any harm in doing that. He thought he was just making sure I was not going to go out with her, you know, and meet any people, period. <laughs> I was never, ever in fear for myself, never well, except maybe one time. But anyway, that's another story. The Colombo crime family is, is very well known. And you married Jerry and, and became part of that. But what was it like mm -hmm. being inside of a family like that? Oh, suffocating. I love them, though, okay? Okay, wait. I love them now. I've loved them more than I have it. There's been some knock down drag outs where I didn't ever want to speak to them again and I didn't speak to them I made Jerry he could talk to his family all he wanted just leave me out of the family his family life it was crazy it was like straight out of Sicily I couldn't believe it it was definitely a different lifestyle when we talked to you you told us about some rules and here is a little something that we weren't able to put in the show and we thought we would love to share with you here. Because I didn't always follow their rules, I um, got in an argument with Jerry's parents. I didn't let them tell me what to do or how to raise my kid or do whatever. Well, they're old school, and if you do not name the firstborn son after the father-in-law, that's total disrespect. Well, my husband wanted a junior, and I said, okay, you want a junior? It's gonna be Gennaro Colombo Jr. Well, they disowned him. And when I seen that, I saw the hurt in my husband. And so I went to him and I said, if you're gonna get disowned over a name, um, we'll name him Francisco Gennaro Colombo. As soon as we did it, everything was great. <laughs> Things like that shouldn't be important. So these rules were really starting to piss me off. I mean, this is even one thing I was told by his father that um, if my boy's hair gets long, they're not allowed on my property. I'm like, what, really? So I told Jerry, I said, go your hair out if you want to. Then it turned into a mullet, so I said, no, I'll cut your hair. <laughs> um, but 
Um, they couldn't have tattoos. What else was it? Uh, oh, oh, we, we were celebrating a birthday. And I smoked a cigarette on the way to their house, right? And Mr. Colombo, he smelled it on me. And they started speaking Italian. And then Jerry raised his voice to him, and then he says, Robin, let's get out of here right now. So we, we leave, and he goes, my, my dad said, you weren't allowed on the property because you smoked cigarettes. I'm like, really, really? I said, wait, you kill people, but you can't smoke cigarettes. Hmm. He started laughing, I said, okay. I'm sorry. Oh my God. Why? Why are you laughing at that? Because it's still so ludicrous to me. Those rules—they are still the same rules. But yeah, they just had so many rules. That was their life. And then you know, being a good Sicilian wife that Mai is, she waits on him hand and foot. His coffee. She cooks all day, just whatever you can picture a Sicilian mother, wife doing, that's what she does. And she's very good at it, mind you. She's a very great cook. And I looked over at Jerry and I said, uh, <clears throat> you know you're not getting that from me, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. Because <laughs> Jerry cooked better than I did. Hell, I, I really don't even cook. <laughs> you do still smoke. Actually, I've cut down on it. That's good. I don't know what happened there. Yeah, I have. Well, good for you. Maybe I'm more comfortable. With the smoking and with you rebelling against Jerry, Jerry Colombo's parents, Ma and Pa. Oh, yeah. What drives you to do that? I was trying to show them that Jerry was his own man, had his own family now. That they did not run him anymore like that. In the fa they didn't run all the families. So you were trying to prove a point. Right. I was standing up for me and my husband. You know, I was raised in a totally different environment. He was raised with bodyguards. They couldn't have kids over to their house. They couldn't give out their telephone numbers to friends. And I felt sorry for him. He couldn't have any pets. They were guard dogs. It was just, it was just crazy. They wanted our life to be their life, I guess. But I was the most rebellious against them. You're marrying into a new family. What did they think of the fact that you already had a daughter? Well, because Jerry and I were already living together, they could tell that he was determined. They knew Jerry and I were very much in love. To not accept my daughter, I would have left him. Yeah, yeah. Just because she didn't live with us, that was her choice. She always had the option to live with us. But she was stuck with her girlfriends in Jacksonville. See, I didn't have that option. I grew up with a Navy father, and we moved every two years. So I was used to moving around. What was your relationship with your dad and with your, your parents like compared to the Colombo family? Mm. Wow, it was like day and night. Mrs. Colombo dotes over her children with love and affection and waits on them hand and foot. Where my mother <laughs> was um, not affectionate whatsoever. I found out later in life that she was never taught to be affectionate, so she did not know how to give show affection. My dad, he was stern, a military man. But once the grandkids started coming, he softened up. As we were sharing with you episode two, one of the things that we wanted to be mindful of was this might be the first time that you'd seen your father, Buddy Fisher. Oh, God. In, uh, in quite some time. And I, I don't know if you even knew that we had gotten no. that footage from the FBI. What was it like to see your father in that situation? Um, uh, 
Excuse me. It was very hard. It was hard because I've lost him, you know. He's he's not with us anymore. And my dad being the above and approach kind of man and high up in the military, never breaking the law. That's why he was sweating so much. He didn't know how to lie. I felt terrible for him. I just wanted to give him a big hug. Yeah, yeah it was it, it's it's such a difficult thing because yeah, you know, the from the FBI standpoint, they're they're looking at getting evidence. They're they're doing whatever they can yeah. for the case and they don't realize right. fully what's what's going on. Even at the time, they were working all of this out and getting all this information. Just gathering evidence. It was very hard to watch, but I watched it. It was good to see him, I'll say that, and hearing his voice, because I lost him in 08. Mm, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, Hopefully he's in a better place, <laughs> because he was never the same after that. He Like, he was never the same? No, he was never the same after getting caught. No, he wasn't. That, that tour... That took years off his life hmm. because being such, um, you know, a man of his country, being in the military, intelligence in the military, and to go from that to being a convicted felon, he never thought that would ever happen in his lifetime. So when he did call me for that ticket, I assumed he must really need it. You know, what are you going to do? Your father. Of course I would give it to him. I'd give anybody I love if they asked me for it. You know, being the black sheep of the family, that I could come to his rescue. God, literally, I would give up a million dollars for my father. And I did. How did your father know what you were up to? Because I tell him. <laughs> <laughs> like, take us, I mean, take us back to that day. Like... You just called him up and say, hey, hey, Dad, by the way, that McDonald's Monopoly game? Oh, no, 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 nothing like that, no. Actually, Jerry approached my father the first time, and I didn't know he did. And he told me, and I, I went off on him. I said, what the hell do you think you're doing? You don't go to my family. They're nothing like your family. They don't do this kind of crap. He goes... Forget about it, Robin, you know. He goes, he said no. I said, He said, so that's that. And I'm like, yeah, I would imagine he said no. I said, leave him alone. So when I got that phone call, you can best believe I was very surprised. How much time had passed since, you, since Jerry Colombo had gone to your dad and first talked to him about it? You know what? I would say maybe a year. Oh, wow. So it was a good amount of time. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So something must have happened with my father and finances. Mm. My mother was very materialistic. <laughs> something must have happened for him to take on that. And as you guys saw the video, he wasn't a very good liar. Yeah, and a person that doesn't doesn't usually have something to hide is not a good liar. No, no. Jerry, on the other hand, he could lie. Oh, my God. And you would know the truth, and you would almost believe him. He was so good. I mean that in a loving way. Mm -hmm. Okay? I'm not bashing him. I'm, I do mean that in a loving way, yeah. so to speak. He, you know, he, he, had, that, he had that charm. <laughs> <laughs> LOL. <laughs> what did you think when you your Jerry, Jerry Colombo, first mentioned this mm -hmm. whole thing to you? Okay, he called me from New York, and he told me that Uncle Dominic introduced him to this guy that was in charge of this thing. To him, this thing was a job, to do a job, anything, you know? He just called it the thing. And if it was a good thing, he would tell me, tutti gusti, sono juicy. And that meant, that was code for... Everything is great. Everything is wonderful. I'm doing good things. But when he did first tell me about it, I really wasn't that impressed. 
because I was trying to do the math of him do, doing things with other people winning. And I'm like, Jerry, is it really worth it? Because they're winning the money and you're doing all this work, flying around, doing whatever, you know, and then by taxes and this and that. Then when he came home and then it started happening, it just kind of took a life of its own. When I actually started seeing the million dollar tickets and that they could actually prosper people that I knew, then I changed my tune. I was very happy for my friends and my family to have that. If you had a pot of gold, let's say, and you were able to... To hand that out to your family, especially if you've disappointed them. For me to be able to have that kind of power, I guess, or whatever, ability, I'm sorry. I felt good about it. And, and as you started to be involved with this opportunity that you guys saw, you had a chance to meet Jerry Jacobson. I did. And talk with him frequently. How often would he call the house? Oh, almost like daily or every other day at least. They um, did other things together. They worked together. They worked together. How so? Well, I don't know everything because I didn't want to know everything. Sometimes he would go into his office to talk and sometimes he would be in the kitchen, you know, and I would hear them talking in the background about stuff. It wasn't about the Monopoly. They didn't discuss Monopoly on the phone. At least not all the time. Mm, Yeah, I don't think they ever really discussed it. You would talk with Jerry Jacobson even sometimes when... Jerry wasn't home. And and what what was that like? Did you guys have good conversations? We did. Did you become friends? I I like to think we did. (laughs) What was Jerry Jacobson like? He was very classy to me. He just seemed like... He had his shit together, excuse my language. He oozed of power. Really? So it's somebody that when you're around him or when you're talking to him, you feel like they they're he's fully under control. Like he's he's the one pulling the strings on everything going on. Yes, most definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You knew it. You felt it. His presence, everything about him, his mannerisms. Did he ever uh, bring you guys a rack of ribs? <laughs> Actually, no. He and my husband fixed an Italian dish together in the kitchen. What was what was the dish? Oh, I don't even remember the name of it. Not being a cook myself, it's not a uh, a regular dish. But they they would they cook together in your kitchen. Yes, they did. I didn't. I was on the patio having wine. So we had heard that Jerry Colombo, your husband, you know, was also very generous too. And assuming that he was bringing in all kinds of money from various Mm -hmm. uh, sources. Sources. Right. Right. Do you have any idea how much money he had either in the safe or in the bank? No. No, I don't. Right. How many game pieces do you think that your husband, Jerry Colombo, helped distribute? Mm, quite a bit. I, at least a dozen, at least. I'm sure there's more. I mean, a dozen that I, I could think of. Rob, we're getting close to the end. Thank you so much for taking okay. the time to talk to us. I love talking to you guys. Yeah. You're like goombas. <laughs> 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 I had to say it. What the hell? <laughs> Well, I am half Italian, so that helps. Uh, see, so you understand. This has been great, and uh, stay uh, stay healthy. My daughter and I are doing um, juicing and cleansings and all kinds of stuff. Well, it sounds yeah. like you've got nine lives, and hopefully, hopefully you're only on the uh, first couple. No, I don't know about that. I have probably a couple more. I've, I know I've been through a few. Well, Robin, thank you again so much. Thank you for for doing this and thank you guys. Great talking to you, and we will uh, we'll talk to you soon. Now, Brian, what is on tap for episode three? 
we have a chance to meet Gloria Brown, one of the winners, and we're going to talk about a really incredible business venture that Jerry Colombo got involved in. <laughs> yeah, incredible indeed. And next week, we're going to be answering listener questions. So if you have any questions, James, how do people uh, write in? You can send us an email at mcmillionspodcast at hbo.com. That's McMillions with an S, not the normal dollar sign. Don't forget to check out McMillions airing Monday nights at 10 p.m. on HBO. And see you next week for episode three on the McMillions podcast. This podcast is produced by FunMeter in conjunction with Unrealistic Ideas. For FunMeter, I'm Brian Lazarte. And I'm James Lee Hernandez. Joe Fenstemaker produced this episode. Our consulting producer is Barry Finkel from Pineapple Street Studios. The music you heard here comes from our actual series and was composed by Panara Toprak. Unrealistic Ideas is Mark Wahlberg, Stephen Levinson, and Archie Gibbs. And of course, none of this is possible without our fantastic partners at HBO. You can find the McMillions podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, the HBO Go and Now apps, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you next week for episode three. Thanks for listening.